And we're going to go on right now to the last panel of the day, reminding you we have some awesome panels going on tomorrow as well. And the, the last panel of the day, uh, I'd like to call up the people who are here. By the way, there were really minor compared to all the, the things that needed to be done, some, my, some mistakes that were made uh, in between what was, what was there and, and what went through to the printers. The, uh, so Doug Zadonis is and has been selected uh, for, a, for quite a while as one of the uh, people who will be on this panel. So if you guys can come up and sit down up here. Uh, and uh, Tammy Wall and Jia Li uh, and Olivier George and Michael Taff and uh, Adam Halberstadt. So come on up. Uh, if there's not, uh, we'll, see if we, we'll see if we can grab some additional chairs, if we can. Uh, but uh, while we're getting set, I'm going to turn this over uh, to the chair, uh, Kara Baggett. Uh, uh, also a dear friend, uh, a wonderful researcher, uh, and she is an assistant professor in our department. She came to us from Yale. Her major area of work is child and adolescent psychiatry. Uh, adolescent substance use disorders uh, fits right into that, and the overlap between ad uh, substance use disorders in adolescence and uh, child uh, psychopathology. Uh, she's also especially interested in using new and very important technologies for these kinds of studies. So with that, uh, and uh, the plea that we end a little before 5, uh, I'm going to turn this, uh, excuse me, a little before 5.15 it looks like, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Kara. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I was actually prepared to introduce you as well, Mark, but you stood up faster than I could. So. <laughs> um, so I just want to say the one thing that Mark left out for his own introduction um, that I think is, has been really invaluable for me and I think probably for the department as well is that um, Mark has been really instrumental in sort of mentorship um, at all levels. So from medical students, postdocs, residents, trainees, and, and me as well as early faculty. Um, so I've really appreciated that in the three years that I've been here as well. So just add that. Okay, so we've got um, a very distinguished panel. Um, because we're running behind, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm just going to introduce uh, first two new faculty to our department. Um, I think as of April 1st, yes? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Mike Taff and Olivier George have come over from Scripps, um, so they will do a brief introduction of themselves. So Mike will come up first. Thank you. So, um, we started off the morning with the, uh, with the oldest two members of the department, the original two members, and I think, because I signed after Olivier did, that that makes me the uh, most recent member of the department. <laughs> um, so in, in trying to address both a, a brief introduction to, to those of you who don't know me, and in trying to meet this, this charge we were given this morning about um, to, to the presenters to uh, give some, some indication of what got them going as a scientist, I was going to do that. Um, first, for those of you who don't know, and this is the homecoming part, um, I trained in the psychology department here. My first bl blush with this department was when I went sort of nervously, a young graduate student, to ask Mark Geyer to be on my committee. He graciously did so. Um, after defending, uh, I did a brief uh, postdoc here in psychiatry with Steve Foote right before he decided to go to NIMH um, under Dilip Justi's uh, T32. I then went to Scripps as a postdoc with Lisa Gold, who many of you, many of you know. And in 2000, I was appointed uh, on, on her departure to take over her lab, basically, and the rest is uh, history. Um, so in terms of what gets me going as a scientist, um, there are many things, but one thing that Marcus Heilig was here a couple weeks ago, and I think he spoke in psychiatry as well, and I assume he said something about reverse translation being important. And what I realize is that, you know, my translation of that is basically that I have an unhealthy interest in what the kids these days are doing. And that's my version of the reverse translation. I'm going to give you a couple of flavors of that quickly. Um, it's a little bit of a sidebar, but I mean, some smart ass, um, sorry, uh, <clears throat> wrote that <laughs> the greatest translational success in treating substance abuse is informational transfer. And that's basically the prevention side of things, right? So we've heard a lot about treating uh, substance abuse once it's become uh, enshrined in somebody. But if we can prevent it or if we can do things that reduce uh, use, this is actually the most important thing. And so that depends on information. And this is one of the things I was really heartened. My father-in-law was reading me the, the, the marijuana initiative uh, back in 2016 before we voted on it. And as he got down to the bottom, and I said, that sounds like Igor Grant. 
Like it sounds like it sounds like him. So I was very very impressed that there was going to be information generation um, in the context of that of that public policy goal. And I think it ties into my my sort of belief that we we as scientists need to be doing science that's relevant to uh, public policy goals and individual decision making, as well as trying to fix people who are already harmed. Um, this is a brief summary of my recent work. I didn't want to belabor this, but just to point out that under this rubric of, of what the kids are doing, uh, we've had recent interest in the bath salts or the synthetic caffeinone stimulants. Uh, we do have had a little bit of interest in cannabidiol. Um, and then the e-cigarettes or vapor inhalation. And then finally, the prescription opioid crisis, which is not just the kids these days, but it does touch on them. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about two of these interests. The, uh, the bath salts, the caffeinone stimulants, is a, is a sort of a... a, a a, um, a repetition of what happened in the 80s before I actually became interested in science. Um, and this was just a cartoon from Doonesbury suggesting how back with the amphetamines, there was a rush to try to uh, manipulate hang bits off the amphetamine core structure uh, to try to keep ahead of the feds, keep them legal, and do things that people found enjoyable. This came back with a vengeance um, with, uh, do I have a pointer? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. You so, um, this, as you can probably recognize, is this sort of um, thing that you put in a grant application, which I did. But um, the bottom line is that there were a bunch of molecules, and again, people were hanging bits off them. We didn't know what they did. I found it kind of professionally insulting that after about uh, 2008, 2010, uh, these have been around for a while, particularly a few of them have been blown up big in the UK. And we basically weren't studying them. We didn't know much about them, except people saying, well, they kind of look like the amphetamines we already know all about. People like Mark Geyer have told us everything we need to know about things like the 3,4-methylene dioxy structure, so what would we need to do, right? Um, but <laughs> because I sort of thought, well, we at least should know something, at least should find out where we are, um, I tried to go after this. And as it turned out, um, again, this is the grant-related version where you put sort of structure activity and say we want to examine parts of the structure and we want to examine this alkyl tail and what does it do, and um, there's a whole bunch more of them that people are doing. And they sort of started to emerge over time as having these different properties. One was very cocaine-like, a restricted transporter inhibitors, although they were fairly dopamine selective, unlike cocaine. These are up here. This is Flocka, by the way. Um, that blew up in South Florida. And there were some that were very MDMA-like, which was, you know, my real interest. Um, and so just a couple pieces of data. One, um, even the ones that were most boring, right? So the ones that were, oh, this is traditional stimulants, very potent. People are going to take it like gangbusters. Even those turn out to be interesting. So these are, uh, first data slide, sorry. Um, these are uh, three individual animals being trained in self-administration sessions, intravenous self-administration sessions. These are rats. Um, and what we did is we gave them access to a running wheel. So here's their running wheel activity. That's over here on this axis. That's in this kind of colored dot here. And then after a while, this rat discovers the drug. And I say that because you can see these particular, I, I picked them to show you, but they have this kind of binging behavior in the first day. And then they settle down to a sort of stereotypical self-administration pattern, which is very stable on short access. But the interesting thing was that they stopped running on the wheel. Now, of course, this was, <laughs> somebody said something about, um, about David Siegel's uh, point that, you know, it's the unexpected stuff. Well, we kind of expected a more gradual diminution of the wheel activity behavior as self-administration took over. And what we found out, these are session by session, but it actually happened right away within five minutes. As soon as they discovered drug, they didn't want to touch the wheel again. So there's some interesting things that pop up, even with what you think are the most boring, um, maybe, of these, of these compounds. Uh, this is a, these are self-administration data again with infusions taken over six hours, and this is vehicle, and the point is, is that MDMA, which is not very well preferred in a self-administration setting, will be, will be self-administered by animals, but some of these cathinones that you think, well, they should be, and there's pharmacology, not just structure, they should be kind of like MDMA, they turn out to be more preferred. So this is kind of the span of things where you go into it because we don't know anything about it, the kids are doing it, we need to know something about it, and all of a sudden you, you find interest in uh, molecules that can actually help us re-examine some of the things we thought we knew from the amphetamines. We kind of stopped at meth versus MDMA, um, but then there's this breadth of, of properties. All right, hopefully I'm not going on too long. Um, Actually, we do need to move along. Okay. okay. So the final thing is, is that juuling, I'm a parent, kids are juuling nowadays, we had a doubling, <coughs> and we went to, well, first of all, I should point out that very rapidly after the e-cigs came out, people started putting marijuana in them. Um, including these jewels, which there's a refillable product, you can put marijuana in it. And so we are working on vaping rats. And so this is just an example of a rat um, filled with a vapor chamber generated by e-cigarette devices. I'll end there. I can be found in SCAGS. Um, 
at coffee shops and our animal lab will be in the MTF. Hi, so I'm Olivia George and I'm gonna try to do that in about two minutes and a half. So I apologize if it's a little too fast, but um, so I am coming from Scripps Research Institute also. I've been there for close to 14 years and I started my lab about six years ago. Um, and so the core of uh, what we do in the lab is about um, animal models and behavioral analysis. So we developed and refined animal models of drug addiction, uh, including all major drugs. And those animal models cover obviously the, the bright side of addiction, right? The reward, the pleasure, the cognitive enhancement. This is what 95% of people do because this is really easy to do in a couple of days. Uh, you can have those animal models uh, validated in your lab. Now we also incorporate something that is a little bit more difficult, which is including the dark side, the pain, the irritability, the stress, okay, the anger, the frustration that you have when you are when you are going through withdrawal and protected abstinence. And this is a lot more difficult because you need to have animal model with extended access to the drug for weeks or months. Um, so we have refined those models and developed some, uh, including the capacity to um, expose this animal to. Um, like Mike, Mike is doing too, with uh, electronic cigarettes and we get animals to vape alcohol or, or nicotine to the point of becoming dependent, which is uh, really exciting for medication development and understanding addiction. So I'm gonna very quickly show you three axes of research. The first one is about genetic addiction, genetic of addiction-like behavior. And so we're leading those two studies funded by NIDA on oxycodone and cocaine where we are going to screen the highest number of animals for self-administration in a single study because we need to reach more than a thousand individuals, right? N equal a thousand over five years. And so diversity is probably our greatest strength in research, both from the PI, the experimenter, and the subject you're studying. So this is our version of diversity. On the bottom, you have those rats that come in different shape and color, and some are cranky, and so others are very chill, and they don't take the same amount of drugs, right? So we're gonna try to find gene variants that can predict this behavior. Uh, a second aspect is trying to develop new novel therapeutic approaches. So we work a lot with uh, pharmaceutical companies as well as uh, academic to try to uh, bring forward small molecules, biologics, um, and some of them are often receptor, which are really exciting to study because there is not much done there, uh, as well as um, other treatment like deep brain stimulation, or opto or chemogenetic. And then, the last part that I'm uh, really excited about is about um, neuronal network. And we're trying to f understand how those neurons are uh, reacting to drugs and withdrawal. What you see here is a brain that has been cleared, uh, imaged with a light microscope, and every flickering dot is a neuron that has been activated by cocaine. And so we use this approach to try to map the entire brain uh, when you are intoxicated and when you are going through withdrawal. Um, to try to understand how the whole brain is reacting during those neuron adaptation. And you, what you see on the, on the right part is what I would call brain print of addiction. And you can see about 200 brain regions uh, intercorrelated, and you can see the changes that you have between an uh, individual that drinks only recreationally alcohol uh, on the top and one that is highly dependent on, on alcohol. And you see all of a sudden alcohol addiction it's not about just a couple of brain regions that are important, like the accumbens or the prefrontal cortex. You see that the whole brain is important, right? And I think it's, it's an important step toward the understanding of, of what addiction is. And if you want to know more about that, uh, we'll have, I think, a half a dozen poster at the symposium in a couple of weeks, the Judd Young Symposium. Um, so this is my team, and uh, we're supported by uh, uh, NIDA and IEEE and, uh, and TRDRP. Thank you. Um, so the panelists had, had um, prepared remarks about all of our lecturers, but um, I think just for the interest of time, we'll open it up for discussion um, for the audience. So if anyone has any questions, our panelists cover uh, a bunch of different areas. So alcohol use, cannabis use, nicotine, tobacco-related disorders, methamphetamine, um, basic science, clinical-related science. So please ask away. It's just, I will Very knowledgeable people. Okay. Abe, I think. Uh, Mark, this is actually a question for you. Uh, 
I was expecting, huh, there's not a chair there, I was expecting uh, when you showed us that the offspring had higher rates of alcohol use disorder than their uh, parents, that you were going to blame the mothers, because that's a tradition uh, in our field, but also because it would be a parsimonious explanation that more risk had been brought in by the selection of mates, right? That there was a, some kind of assortative mating. Do you have genetic and any of these measures on the mothers? And have you looked at that possibility, that there was, in other words, that the choice of mates uh, brought more risk into the families? Thank you. Uh, first of all, we have genetic samples on almost all these people. And they are sitting in the freezer here because they were supposed to be, they were, they were paid for and developed by uh, UCSF and then the Gallo Center went down. So we could ask those questions. I have other studies where we looked at the mothers. The mothers, uh, the rate of alcohol problems in their family is relatively small, not much higher than the general population. And their rate of alcohol use disorders is about the same as most women, just a tad up. What we did for this analysis, only because we did not have those attitudes at age 30 and uh, the uh, environmental events at age 30. So for these analyses, the mothers were left out. Um, the mothers, uh, the, the study was funded for the fathers and then kind of kicking and screaming. It was, we were able to, uh, from the, the uh, National Institutes of Health, because of the money involved, uh, we were able to get some, for, get some of this prospective data from, with all the data from the kids, but not from the mothers. Brief answer, I don't think it was the mothers based on their family histories uh, and uh, their drinking habits. And uh, it's the characteristics on the phenotype side that basically, uh, I think, are the major hints as to what might be going on. We didn't forget the mothers, and I wish we had those data. That's a very good question. Yeah, I have a question, I think, is either for Rob or for Shah. And I'm curious, Rob, you alluded to some of the new me mechanisms for treating tobacco. So, I, And I know Shah has worked with that. Shah, do you want to? Yeah. So uh, one of the uh, targets... Uh, speak into the, the microphone, microphone, please. It's really hard for people to hear in general. Okay. So one of the uh, your system that we are, we are interested in the glutaminergic uh, neurotransmission because uh, um, Sorry, most of I, the I hate to be a bother, but try this. This this especially close to your mouth might be okay. come up possible. <laughs> Sorry. So one of the uh, your uh, uh, system that we are, we are interested uh, is a glutaminergic neurotransmission system because. Um, uh, the glutamate system has been um, um, proved to be associated with not only the rewarding and motivational effect of the uh, substance, but also um, the ring statement, so which can address the high relapse problem in the substance use field. Um, however, um, the, the anal, um um, the glutamate receptors are uh, including two big groups, anotropic and metabo um, uh, metabotropic. The, uh, the NMD receptor, MH receptors, although are very, uh, very well known, the receptors, the mechanism is very clear, however, um, medications targeting these receptors has a lot of a profound side effect which has been approved um, preclinically and clinically. Um, on the other hand, um, so medications that target the metabotropic uh, glutamate system may produce more mild effect with more better, like better uh, side effect profiles. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, yeah. Dr. Zidonis. I, th I think that we'd like to hear a little bit about uh, your thoughts about. Uh, sure. So one, well, the most important thing Mark said, uh, UCSD psychiatry is wonderful. So thank you. Then. And it's great to be a part of this group. Uh, I thought truly amazing for presentations. I could be world class at any conference. Just the importance of a developmental view, a longitudinal long term, looking at high risk groups and then uh, looking at effectiveness and reach. So first, I thought of the public health uh, meets mental health and addiction perspective. And uh, these are such great findings, but how do we translate them to a way an adolescent would hear this? 
uh, if someone prides themselves on how many beers they can drink and how many vodkas they can uh, chug, uh, how do you translate that skill to something that would be more fearsome than uh, in putting pain fibers in them instead of uh, uh, strength? Uh, the cognitive impact that Sandy brought up in hers, how do we translate that kind of finding? It made me think of something that most clinicians don't use, the carbon monoxide meter. Uh, I can tell people they'll die of lung cancer and heart disease and all these things and they don't care, but they blow into a carbon monoxide meter, they see the score and it's like, oh my God, maybe I should quit smoking. Uh, so I think, how do we translate that? Um, I, I thought the high risk group of college students, uh, Mark has other work he didn't present on, but. Uh, when I was at Yale, we saw freshmen go from 10% smokers to 20%. So what goes on in that freshman year? Uh, uh, second area that I wanted to just touch on was the, was the terrific work that Robert's doing. Uh, really amazing for the whole uh, field of tobacco addiction treatment, but particularly in uh, our area in psychiatry. Uh, why don't psychiatrists treat? tobacco addiction. Why are our rates so high? So implementation science, bringing these evidence-based practices into our mental health setting. Uh, how many carbon monoxide meters do we have at UCSD psychiatry? Uh, how often have we used the patch gum spray inhaler uh, lozenge, the seven FDA approved products that we have, let alone some new ones that might help improve outcomes? Uh, uh, we didn't talk as much about psychosocial in this one, but so I just thought I would make sure we were plugging that. Uh, some of the other presentations from previous groups talked about guilt, shame, trauma. Those are all so pervasive in addiction treatment. So how do we cross collaborate ac uh, across the different groups that we've heard all day today? Uh, we haven't really talked at all about families and the importance of engaging them in the process of helping people uh, uh, to quit. Uh, there's a lot of community-based interventions, quit lines. Uh, uh, we're the center of the universe for quit lines, and uh, how do we get a psychiatric patients to get engaged in that? And then since I am at UCSD, I have to, answer, to end with a neurobio question uh, that I raised when I was at Rutgers, and uh, could smoking cause mental illness? So some of these studies that we're looking at with adolescents, uh, there's such, that's the drug people get into very early and often before mental illness occurs. What is the epigenetics of turning on uh, the addiction brain uh, early on and also those that end up getting mental illness. So uh, anyway, really terrific day and of course we wish we had more time and uh, but thank you all for your terrific presentations. Thoughts, Dr. Wall? Yep. Oh, I, well, I... Got to talk right into the... Oh. Right into it. Um, <laughs> so I was asked to comment on Mark's talk specifically, and my good luck was coming to uh, the JDP in the late 1980s, and I had the very good luck to work with Mark. He is a wonderful teacher, a generative mentor, and I have learned so much from him over the years. His study is absolutely one of the landmark studies in the field of alcohol research. As Sandy said, he was already a distinguished researcher in the 1980s, and now he is just a giant in the field. That study to span 35 years, to be multi-generational, to have 100% follow-up at uh, 10 years and 88% at 35 years is really remarkable. Um, just an amazing body of research. And so I am very appreciative that you organized this today and guided us through the whole presentation. And if I go off science and I just get to give kudos to Mark Shuckett for one second. So uh, I uh, remember 30 years ago,
coming to UCSD when I was a resident at UCLA and doing my addiction psychiatry fellowship because I, and that was 30 years ago, so he was already famous then. So I said to myself, I can't imagine doing an addiction fellowship on the West Coast and not hang out with Mark Shuckett. Uh, and then when I go to hang out with Mark Shuckett, guess who I else? So get to hang out with Robert Antonelli. So Robert's in his residency fellowship like I am, and really you were an awesome mentor from that point on, and Robert, you've been a great colleague, and so it's sort of an amazing moment. Here we are hanging out together in this, and I also want to shout out to uh, who invented the nicotine patch, anybody know? A psychiatrist, Murray Jarvik at UCLA when I was there. So again, uh, it, it, you and Murray were great influences on my career, so thanks. So just in the final minute, just because, Adam, you haven't had any chance. So any, sure, any thank you. thoughts? You may notice I look a little bit different than my picture. <laughs> <laughs> so just to bring everything kind of back around, Mark Geyer started the day out with, with his lecture. And I think it's actually relevant to uh, this lecture because when I came to, to work for Mark in, uh, in 2007 as a postdoc, uh, I was working on animal models of hallucinogen effects. And uh, I stayed in, I stayed in uh, in the department, now I'm an associate professor. I was working in animal models, and um, the field ha has really picked up, not so much with the animal component, but really the human component of it. And so and I think it's relevant for this, uh, this session. Uh, psilocybin has now been granted a breakthrough status. It's in entering phase three. Most of that work has been for um, anxiety and depression. But there's also been smaller scale trials for uh, substance abuse. So it's been tried for uh, a nicotine dependence, uh, alcoholism. It's also been tried for um, uh, cocaine abuse. And th the trials are small, but they've been pretty promising. There was one that looked at uh, smokers, and a year after they gave psilocybin, 60% of the, uh, the subjects were still nicotine free. So small trials, but definitely some potential promise there. So it seems like this, is, this would be a good time to potentially revisit some of those, uh, revisit some of that potential. And I think it would be a good thing if we could run those uh, studies here. Uh, Mark and I have been working on planning a, a trial for phantom limb pain. We're not at the point where you know, we're, we could give, give psilocybin to subjects, but we're working on all the approvals. And, uh, but once, once all that work is in place, other trials could go on too, so I just wanted to en encourage everybody to think about that. It's something that's very timely, and uh, psilocybin may, may become an approved drug, so if it has the potential to help people, it would be good to figure out whether that's the case. So I think it's, it's a very timely topic. It just reminded me of all, of all the work that's been done, done on this and how difficult it is to really treat substance abuse. So that was what came to mind for me. Thank you.